In a previous presentation, we have described what the typical mission for an astronaut on board the ISS actually looks like. We have seen that astronauts are involved in different types of activities, systems maintenance, science, robotics, EVA, and so on and so forth. There is one element, however, that we have uh, overlooked, and that is the support astronauts receive from ground, from mission control, to perform their activities in space. Now, what is mission control? What does mission control do? How do flight controllers actually help the astronauts perform their job in space? Well, there have been movies, there have been books, and people normally have a common understanding of what is the role of the flight controllers. From a formal standpoint, we can use the following definition. A mission control center, so the facility hosting mission control, manages aerospace vehicle flights, usually from the point of liftoff until the landing or the end of the mission. A staff of flight controllers and other support personnel monitor all aspects of the mission using telemetry and send commands to the vehicle using ground stations. This is a fairly good definition. It really covers all the main aspects of what Mission Control Center actually does. Of course, this is the general concept and uh, depending on the mission that you fly, you need to have a slightly different approach for mission control. You need to have slightly different functions. It is different whether you're flying a mission in uh, low Earth orbit or you're flying a mission to the moon or a mission to Mars. It is different flying a mission to a space station from flying just a solo mission of a vehicle for a few days in space. Now, obviously, we cannot go into the details of how mission control operations have been implemented throughout the history of human spaceflight. What we can do, however, is to discuss in general what kind of functions are normally covered by mission control during a mission. Obviously, we don't want to make things uh, too abstract, so when we discuss those generic functions, we will put them in a specific context. And the context that uh, we will use is actually Apollo. So we will see how the generic functions that we are discussing were actually implemented in the uh, Apollo missions. A couple of important points I would like to make before we start, however. First of all, we are dealing here only with mission control operations for human spaceflight. We are not touching how satellites are operated and we are not touching how interplanetary probes are operated. The general concepts are more or less the same, but there are some meaningful differences and it is beyond the scope of this talk to cover those missions. Also, uh, one important point is mission control centers, they involve a lot of different people, they involve a lot of different functions. Usually you have hundreds, if not thousands of people, depending on the program, working on the success of the mission. Now to describe how the organization, even in a generic sense, works is also beyond the scope of this, of this talk. What we, will see, what we will do, we will focus on the front room. We will focus on the flight control team sitting on the front line and dealing with the real-time operations of the vehicle being controlled. What we will do, we will look at this picture. This picture is a diagram of what the front room for the Apollo missions actually look like and uh, we will analyze what is the meaning of those positions, what do those positions do, and uh, at the end you should be able to understand how this all works, at least in a generic and a general sense. So, let's get started. Probably the most obvious and most important function that is implemented in all mission control centers is space systems monitoring. Space vehicles are complex machines. You have a lot of different systems that have to work properly 
by themselves and together to ensure that the mission is accomplished, that the astronauts are safe. And uh, monitoring those systems is one of the tasks of the flight controllers on ground. You can see in this picture how space systems monitoring was performed at the time of Apollo. It strikes me always how much could be accomplished during the Apollo program just using machines that are by no means comparable to what we have available right now. You have analog systems, you have um, in a way antiquated communication system and still this was enough to very successfully operate missions to the surface of a different planet. In the Apollo time, space systems monitoring was actually implemented by a number of different positions in the control room. Now, as you very well know, Apollo, at least for the lunar landing missions, had a lunar module and had a command and service module. So, obviously you needed certain people taking care of the lunar module and other people taking care of the command and service module. And uh, even after this split, even after this division, you needed multiple people taking care of the lunar module and multiple people taking care of the command and service module. So for instance, in the control room there was one position in charge of the guidance and navigation as well as propulsion for the lunar module, one position responsible for EVA power system and environmental control system of the lunar module, and of course there were the equivalent controllers for the command and service module. Also, you needed to have somebody in charge of flight dynamics, so where is the spacecraft in space, and you needed to have people in charge of the guidance computer, uh, making sure that where the spacecraft actually thought it was corresponded to where it actually was. Also, in the case of Apollo, there were dedicated people to the retrofire, so all the operations that were necessary to safely bring the astronauts from the lunar surface all the way back to Earth. And also, there was a position in charge of the rocket. Actually, during an Apollo launch, there were three controllers sitting at the booster console. Each of those controllers was responsible for one of the three stages of the Saturn V rocket. And uh, this is actually something that uh, people often confuse. Everybody knows that uh, beside the mission control center, there is also a launch control center. But funny enough, the launch control center actually is not responsible for almost anything during the actual power flight of the rocket. The launch control center is responsible for all the operations that lead to the launch and for the first seconds of the launch itself. Normally, as soon as the rocket clears the pad, control is given from the launch control center to the mission control center. And that's why there was, in the specific case of Apollo, a booster console in the uh, mission operations control room. And by the way, there was also a position responsible just for the communication system, just for the hardware that made possible to have telemetry, to send telecommands to the command and service module and lunar module and to talk to the astronauts. It cannot be understated how important this monitoring of the space systems is for the success of a mission. There are many examples that uh, could be made of um, flight controllers actually saving the mission, but one that is very good in my opinion, comes from the launch of Apollo 12. Now, what happened during this launch is that the lightning struck the rocket during power flight, during ascent. You see here in the picture, the lightning on the top hitting the top of the rocket. Now, as you can imagine, uh, the power system of space vehicles doesn't react very well to that much energy being uh, thrown by a lightning. So actually what happened immediately after the strike is that the power system of the command and service module started giving 
alarms, started providing strange telemetry, and everybody at that point in time was ready to actually abort the flight. The crew in the vehicle, but also the flight controllers on the ground. Now, it is always possible to abort the launch. Uh, in this phase of the flight, that would have meant firing the launch escape system, detaching the command and service module from the vehicle, and uh, actually having the astronauts land a few kilometers away. But, of course, this is not something that you want to do unless you have no other choice. And it turned out that there was a different choice. Actually, when everybody was ready to abort, the ECOM, which is the position responsible for the electrical power system of the command and service module, just made a call that turned later on into legend. Flight, try SCE to AUX. And actually, as it turned out, the flight director at that point had no idea what the guy was talking about. He didn't know what SCE was, let alone how to put it to AUX but he trusted the engineering judgment and the knowledge of the controller and has the spacecraft communicators, and we will see later on what the spacecraft communicator does, to voice this instruction up to the crew. Capcom did it, and also the commander of Apollo 12, Pete Conrad, had no clue what that call meant. And this is something that uh, must be clarified. The Apollo Command and Service Module contained hundreds of switches, and there was actually no way for every astronaut to know exactly the function and even the location of all of those switches. They would have a general understanding of what they did, but actually they normally knew by heart only the part of the switches that were accessible from their seat. And the person who actually had responsibility for that switch was Alan Bean, and he knew exactly where the switch was. It's the one at the very bottom of this control panel. He flipped the secondary conditioning equipment to auxiliary, and uh, out of a sudden the power system reset and the flight could actually continue as normal. This is just one example of why real-time monitoring of space systems is important, of why you need to have a person that is specifically dedicated to those subsystems, that knows his subsystems like his own pockets, and that can also make calls in real time under pressure that are terse, concise, and to the point. Obviously, you cannot you cannot come in that kind of situation to the flight director with a statement like, OK, flight, I have seen a year ago during a simulation that there was a similar signature here, and this happened because of this and that. And by the way, uh, I know the guy who has designed the system, a very good guy. And uh, what we should do is to actually flip the switch that it's in the bottom right corner of the panel, and we should put it to auxiliary. That would not be appropriate in general, but also not in this kind of situation. John Aron, who was the guy actually manning the Econ console, just said, flight, try SCE to AUX, and that was enough. Now, if it is important to monitor the space systems, it is also very important to monitor the ground systems. Obviously, flight controllers rely on a very complex infrastructure of communication lines, computers, ground stations, to talk to the space vehicle. Now, nowadays, for low Earth orbit operations, we can rely on uh, the tracking and data relay satellite system to have permanent connection between the mission control center and the International Space Station, for instance. Well, this is a luxury that wasn't available in the Apollo times. You see here a diagram of what was called at that point the manned space flight network. And uh, this was a complex mesh of ground stations, but also antennas mounted on ships. Ships located in specific positions where they could actually contribute in making as much coverage as possible for the spacecraft. Now, monitoring this network was the task of the network controller. And the task of this network controller, especially in the Apollo time, wasn't really an easy one. 
I mean, you have to understand that uh, at that point, nothing like communicating with a spacecraft in lunar orbit had been attempted before. The technology was analog technology to today's standards in a way primitive, and even the communication lines between the ground stations and the mission control center weren't always reliable. To the point that at the very beginning of the Mercury program, NASA had to post controllers and spacecraft communicators at least to each of the key ground stations so that they could actually take decisions and could talk to the crew in case the connection to the main mission control center, which at that point was at Cape Canaveral, was not available. Anyway, ground systems monitoring, space systems monitoring, main elements of mission control. Another important element is obviously planning. Um, a space mission, especially one as complex as Apollo, required a very careful planning. There were a number of activities that needed to happen. Those activities were interconnected to each other. There were dependencies. And uh, of course, as much as you can prepare a plan in advance, as much as you can spend months refining this plan and making sure that everything has been deconflicted and arranged in the most efficient way, still, you will need to change this plan when the time of flying actually comes. And that's why in the control room, at the Apollo time, there was a flight activities officer. The role of the flight activities officer was really to keep the plan together, to do the replanning based on real-time circumstances and uh, making sure that the mission objectives would be still fulfilled, even in case of problems, to the maximum extent possible. Now, an important element in human spaceflight is, of course, medical operations and medical monitoring. Uh, we want to make sure that the vehicle is in a good shape. We want to make sure that the power system, the thermal control system, and all the science hardware works properly, but even more so, we want to make sure that the astronauts are doing well. Now, at the time of Apollo, this was ensured by having real-time telemetry, real-time biomedical telemetry coming down to the flight surgeon. You see here one of the uh, Apollo flight surgeon checking uh, biomedical data. And this flight surgeon normally would sit beside the spacecraft communicator. This is what in the diagram is indicated as life systems officer. Now, crew communication. Crew communication is, a, is an interesting point, is an interesting topic. One might think, I have experts in the room, each is responsible for a certain subsystem, for a certain activity. If there is a need to talk to the astronauts about something, I can simply ask the expert to go on the space to ground or air to ground channels, as they were called at some point, and have this guy talking to the crew. Well, this is one way it could be done, but uh, historically it has been seen that actually this way wouldn't work too well. What has been always done, both on the US and the Russian side actually, was to have a single interface between the crew in space and the flight controllers on the ground. The single interface has different call signs depending on the mission, depending on the nation as well. Uh, but collectively, the position is called the spacecraft communicator. Now, the spacecraft communicator needs to collect information coming from different sources and package it together in a way that is understandable and uh, uh, efficient for the astronaut to listen to and execute. And that is actually why, for a long time, the position of the spacecraft communicator was actually covered only by astronauts. In the very early time, it was even so that only astronauts from the backup crew were covering this position. And actually, you see in this picture a very nice image of uh, three astronauts sitting at the Capcom console during the Apollo 11 landing. There is Charlie Duke in the, in the foreground, Jim Lovell, who became later very famous because of Apollo 13 in the, in the second position, and Fred Hayes, who would also fly on Apollo 13 
is the guy on the, uh, on the background. One other reason why astronauts were actually chosen to perform crew communication is because, well, they know the people in space and the people in space trusted them. And this, of course, simplified enormously the crew communication burden. So that's where the spacecraft communicator was actually sitting during the uh, Apollo times. Now we come to mission management. We have seen that there are a lot of people in the control room. There are a lot of functions that must be fulfilled. You have a team, and if you want the team to work properly, you need a director. You need somebody who can make real-time decisions and can coordinate this team so that the mission objectives and crew safety can be ensured. Now, if you look at the diagram in the Apollo control room, you realize that there are actually four positions contributing in different capacities to mission management. Now, the question would be, who is actually the person in charge in this room? You cannot have a committee directing in real-time space operations. Well, it turned out that final authority over real-time decisions is always on the flight director. And uh, this is not something that was actually true since the very beginning. In the Mercury time, it was actually possible for the managers to overrode or override the flight director in real time. But an accident happened at some point that uh, convinced the guy you've seen in the previous picture, Chris Kraft, the first flight director and actually the father of mission control on the US side to change the rules. And this is something that happened during the orbital flight of uh, John Glenn, which was actually the first orbital flight for a US astronaut. Now, at some point during the mission, mission control received a uh, telemetry saying the heat shield has detached. This didn't necessarily mean that the heat shield was floating in space on its own because as you can see from the picture there was actually a uh, retro rocket package being attached to the heat shield and strapped to the capsule. But it was anyway a worrying signal because after the deorbit burn that package would be released and at that point, if the, there was really a problem with the heat shield, then the astronauts would have been unable to re-enter safely. It would have died because there would be nothing anymore protecting the capsule from the heat of re-entry. There were a lot of discussions on the ground. There were some people convinced that uh, everything was fine and there was actually a problem with the telemetry. And there were other people saying, well, that might be true, but uh, shall we really risk uh, the life of the astronauts? Is there anything that we can actually do to, um, to actually make sure that the heat shield would stay in place even though there is actually a problem? Well, one of the ideas that were proposed was to actually leave the retro rockets package attached to the heat shield even after the deorbit burn. This was an off-nominal configuration, but the, the way people were thinking at that point was, okay, it will keep the heat shield strapped to the capsule in the very early phases of re-entry. Then, of course, the package will be burned by the heat of re-entry, but by the time it will detach, there would be enough aerodynamic pressure on the heat shield to keep it pressed against the capsule. So John Glenn would be still able to come back to Earth. Of course, this wasn't something that uh, came without risk because that was a completely untested and unproven configuration and there was certainly risk associated with it. As it turned out, the flight director was Chris Kraft at that point and he was firmly convinced that the telemetry was faulty, that everything was fine with the heat shield, there was absolutely no problem. And Chris Kraft knew the vehicle. He had the very sound engineering understanding of the vehicle, and he was probably the best person to judge at that point whether it was a faulty telemetry or not. Now, managers, as it is 
often the case, they thought they knew better. And they said, okay, you know what? We don't risk. We leave the package attached and we re-enter in this unnominal configuration. We will take additional risk, but we think this is justified because if there is no heat shield, well, we have a, a real serious problem. Well, Zhang Len was asked to keep the retro rockets on. He re-entered with the retro rockets attached. The re-entry was, re was far from nominal because the capsule was never designed to have this additional piece of hardware in front. But anyway, he managed to come back to Earth safe. Now, as it turned out, it was actually a telemetry issue. The heat shield had never had any problem, and uh, the decision of re-entering with the package attached should have never been taken. And that's, that was very well understood by, by everybody, and that's when Chris Craft actually made a decision to change the rules and to make sure that the flight director couldn't be overruled by anybody on a real-time decision. Of course, the managers can still fire him afterwards, but in real time, nobody can come to the flight director and say, okay, you have taken a decision, but I am overriding you. Now, if we just try to summarize, those are the typical functions that are present in every mission control. You have space systems monitoring, you have ground systems monitoring, planning, medical operations, crew communication, and mission management. You see that there are a couple of positions that are left out, but this is because they are either not really flight control positions or they are absolutely specific of the, uh, of the Apollo time. Just to give an example, the Department of Defense position was just the liaison between Mission Control Center and the recovery, the military recovery forces deployed to get the capsule from the ocean after, after landing. Now, you might think, okay, this is great. You have told us in general how mission control works, uh, but why in the world did you choose Apollo? Apollo is in a way ancient history. It's, uh, it's an interesting program, but uh, we would like to know how does this work for the ISS, which is what we are actually flying right now. Well, the reason why I didn't start with the ISS is because the ISS is such a, a complex system and it requires such a complex mission control that uh, it wouldn't be a good example to actually understand the basics. Now, think about it. Apollo was an incredibly complex program, but in a way it was conceptually simple. You have one nation operating end-to-end -end a space vehicle. You have one mission control center, one flight director. It, it is a complex task that they have to carry out, but at the same time they have a complex clean scenario. Now think about the ISS. We have mentioned there are five international partners. You have different modules operated by uh, different partner agencies. You have cargo vehicles operated by partner agencies. You have cargo vehicles operated by actually private companies. And each of those elements actually requires mission control. And as it turned out, there are several control centers contributing to ISS operations in different capacities. The main control centers are MCC Houston, POIC, COLCC, MCC Moscow, and SIPSI. But there are a host of other control centers like the Dragon Control Center, the Orbital Control Center, you have the HTV Control Center, you had the ATV Control Centers, you have additional smaller control centers responsible for specific activities. So when you actually look at the mission control implementation for the ISS, you're actually looking at a very complex scenario. And there is a set of relatively complex rules ensuring that this all works flawlessly. And these rules have been developed and refined over 20 years of operations. Now we don't want to get into that kind of complexity and into, into that kind of details, but uh, at least we want to cover what the main five control centers are actually responsible for. And uh, when I will go through those five control centers, you have to remember that each of those implements with different names, with slightly different uh, 
differences, the main concepts, the main functions that I've described in general before. So if we start with uh, Houston, well, MCC Houston is responsible for the ISS as a vehicle in general. So the final integration, the final authority is in MCC Houston. In addition, those guys are responsible for the US systems and for things like, for instance, the EVAs performed with the US spacesuits. They are complemented by the Mission Control Center Moscow, which is in Korolev. Those guys are responsible for the Russian part of the station. They take care of the systems of the Russian segment. They take care of the science that is actually performed in the Russian segment. And uh, in the same building of Mission Control Center Moscow, you also have uh, control rooms taking care, for instance, of the Progress vehicle or the Soyuz vehicle when those are in free flight. MCC Houston and MCC Moscow are the main mission control center, but there are other which are also quite important. One of them is the Payload Operations and Integration Center in Huntsville, Alabama. They are responsible for the U.S. science. So all U.S. scientific activities are actually not coordinated and supported by Houston, but they are coordinated and supported by Huntsville. And in a similar fashion in the Columbus Control Center, the flight controllers have responsibility over the Columbus systems and the ESA science performed in Columbus. And likewise, at the Space Station Integration and Promotion Center in Tsukuba, you have people responsible for the space systems and the science performed on board the Kibo Japanese Laboratory.